So good evening, everyone. Welcome to uh, our Thrombosis Canada webinar about the highlights of the ISTH 2023 Congress, uh, Canadian Perspectives. I'm Camille Simard. I'm a general internist and thrombosis physician in Canada, um, Montreal, sorry, and I will be chairing the session this evening. Um, if you have any questions, we'll be answering questions at the end, so please use the chat feature um, in the, the Zoom window, and we'll be answering questions at the end of the presentations. So these are um, my conflict of interests. The faculty involved in the webinar this evening are myself, Dr. Miriam Kimpton, Dr. Mark Bellitruti and Dr. Alfonso Iorio, and we will each be presenting highlights from the Congress. Um, in terms of commercial support for the webinar this evening, this program has received support from Pfizer Canada in the form of an unrestricted educational grant. This is a slide about mitigating potential bias that I will let you leave you to read. This event is accredited, accredited by uh, Thrombosis Canada. You may claim a maximum of 1.5 hours uh, for the webinar this evening and a certificate of attendance will be sent. So the overall learning objectives for this evening, at the end of the presenta presentations, participants will be able to discuss highlights of key thrombosis-related presentations for the ISTH 2023 Congress, as well as hemostasis-related presentations from the Congress that was recently in Montreal. This is our agenda for the evening and the schedule of the different presentations, and as mentioned, question and answers will be at the end. So I'll start this evening with my presentation, um, discussing two different uh, topics. The objectives are really to review highlight talks during ISTH, the first one being the EVE trial and the second one being an approach to research in hematology in transgender persons. So we'll get started. So the first highlighted talk is the EVE trial. It is extending venous thromboembolism secondary prevention with a pixaban in cancer patients. This was presented as a late breaking abstract um, at ISTH by Dr. Robert McBain on behalf of the EVE investigators. The premise for this trial is that cancer associated VT carries a high rate of recurrence and death and guidelines currently recommend continued anticoagulation for these patients as long as active cancer persists. A Pixaban 2.5 milligrams twice daily is an approved dose for long-term secondary prevention of cancer-associated VTE, currently approved regardless of the VTE etiology, whether it is cancer-associated or not. The question that led to this trial is whether a Pixaban 2.5 milligrams twice daily is appropriate for cancer patients. So the EVE trial is a multi-center randomized double-blind trial comparing a Pixaban 2.5 milligrams to 5 milligrams twice daily in patients with cancer-associated VT who had completed 6 to 12 mo months of anticoagulation. Again, this is for secondary prevention. The hypothesis being that the 2.5 milligram dose of a Pixaban is associated with lower combined rates of major and clinically non-major bleeding compared to the apixaban 5 milligrams twice daily in this specific patient population. So if we go straight to patient demographics, this is a trial that included 360 patients, 179 in the apixaban 2.5 milligram group and 181 in the apixaban 5 milligram group. The mean, mean age was 64 years old, about half were female gender, and in terms of qualifying throm thrombotic events, about 60% had a PE, 40% had a DVT. Um, fewer patients, of course, had an upper extremity DVT with very few patients with cerebral venous thrombosis or splanchnic, splanchnic vein thrombosis. When looking at cancer demographics, um, group were 
groups were fairly similar. 60% approximately had distant metastases. Three quarters of the patient population was on active chemotherapy. This is in majority a population of patients with solid tumors, um, with the leading solid tumors being pancreatic, hepatobiliary, colorectal, followed by lung, with between 10 to 20% of patients with heme malignancies. If we move along to results, the primary endpoint, as uh, previously stated, was a combined bleeding endpoint of major and clinically relevant non-major bleeding after uh, over 12 months of therapy. As you can see from the red uh, square, patients had um, patients in the apixaban 2.5 milligram group. There were 16 events of major plus clinically relevant non-major bleeding compared to 22 in the apixaban 5 group. The difference numerically is mainly driven, as you can see, by the bottom line of this table by a decreased a numerical decrease in the um, the number of clinically relevant non-major bleeding, and as you can see the number of major bleeding events was similar in both groups. Um, and so no statistical uh, significantly, sorry, no uh, statistically significant result for the primary outcome. One of their secondary endpoints was the recurrent, uh, th the rate of thrombosis recurrence. As you can imagine in this trial, there were very few events of uh, uh, thrombo thrombosis recurrence. Um, it was similar in both groups with nine events in the EPIX 2.5 group and eight in the EPIX 5 milligram group with one patient in each group that had an arterial event. So in terms of summary and conclusions, in the EVE trial for extended secondary prevention of cancer-associated VTE, EPIXABAN 2.5 milligrams uh, twice daily was associated with a numerically lower combined rate of major plus clinically relevant non-major bleeding compared to the five milligrams twice daily with a, with a hazard ratio of 0.72 that crossed um, the line of unity that is not statistically significant. And the rate of recurrence was similar in both groups. So this trial suggested that low-dose abixaban may be safe and effective, but of course the Authors and the presenter of this trial suggested that further studies are required to answer this clinical question and, of course, highlighted the ongoing larger APICAT trial, which I believe just finished recruiting patients and is, uh, has recruited over 1,700 patients looking at this question. So potentially some interesting safety or reassuring data for the apixaban 2.5 milligram twice daily in this patient population, but more results to come in this sphere. The second talk I wanted to highlight this evening um, is completely different. We're shifting gears. Um, and so I wanted to highlight a talk by Dr. Nathan Connell from, uh, from Boston, who discussed at the Women SSC um, how we should approach clinical research and hematology in transgender persons, challenges, and solutions. So the LGBTQ plus population, as we all know, is a population that is growing. In this talk, we're going to focus on transgender individuals, so the fourth T on this slide. And really, the goal is to discuss the implications of intersectionality and marginalization in the clinical care and in research associate, associated with this patient group, and to stimulate discussion where there is some overlap, such as the risk of VT associated with hormonal therapy and how we approach sensitive populations in clinical care and research. So Dr. Connell described his perspective as a physician who cares for transgender individuals in his clinical and research practice. So we can't really discuss transgender healthcare and not discuss intersectionality, which is a term that is defined differently depending on where you look. But really, it is defined as the cumulative way in which the effects of multiple forms of discrimination, whether it be racism, sexism, or classism, combine, overlap, and intersect, especially in the experiences of marginalized individuals or groups. This is, this is significant, especially in the population with bleeding and clotting disorders, where anecdotally, Dr. Connell reports that some transgender individuals with bleeding and clotting disorders 
feel as though bleeding, their bleeding disorder or their clotting disorder is very much a part of their identity. And they have to navigate that on top of um, dealing with intersectionality, which could be quite challenging. So this is very telling data uh, from the out of the United States from the Trevor Project. It's a survey of 35,000 LGBTQ plus youth aged between 13 and 24 years of age across the US. Um, and this data reports that 42% of LGBTQ youth seriously considered suicide, um, attempted suicide in the past year. And about half reported that they would have wanted counseling from a mental health specialist, but were unable to access it in the past year. This really highlights an issue that is very prevalent in Canada, which reflects the lack, lack of mental health access um, for populations younger and older. And this data also, also showed that LGBTQ youth that had access to spaces that affirmed their sexual orientation and gender identity reported lower rates of attempted suicide. And so having creating safe spaces and uh, um, you know, supporting this patient population affects suicide rates. And so this is something that is quite practically uh, important to, to implement in our thrombosis and, and hemostasis clinics. Um, in terms of mental health and bleeding disorder, uh, data has shown that 40% of young adults with hemophilia stated that they had depressive symptoms and uh, out of the Boston Hemophilia Center, 60% of patients with severe hemophilia reported symptoms um, of post-traumatic stress symptoms or even post-traumatic stress disorder. So what about the intersection of people with bleeding and thrombosis disorders who identify as LGBTQIA+, and what data do we have? So we have to recognize that this is a population that deals with stigmas, fears, and increased anxieties, um, specifically when it relates to disclosing medical conditions. Dr. Connell anecdotally reports that some of his patients feel as though they need to come out to every individual that is part of their health journey from the person at the front desk to the nursing staff to the, the physicians that are caring for them. And this can be quite anxiety provoking and difficult. These are individuals that sometimes can be dealing with multiple different identities, whether medically or um, because of gender identity. They are known to be at higher risk of domestic violence, of uh, homelessness, of mental health disorders, and they may be navigating family planning through adoption and surrogacy, which adds extra barriers. So in terms of transgender health issues, hormonal therapy, as we know, is often used to treat bleeding disorders, and this may or may not align with treatments for gender affirming care. And this can be challenging in specific patients with bleeding disorders. Moreover, gender affirming surgery is a very high risk period, both for bleeding and for thrombosis. Um, and additionally, there are some patients in whom transition from a presenting gender within a traditionally quote unquote male clinic, such as hemophilia clinics, or in patients treated with um, in more traditionally female clinics, such as uh, von Willebrand's disease in obstetrics and gynecology can be challenging. Dr. Connell then presents this slide that I thought was quite helpful because I think the first step to creating a first environment is really to use the correct terms to promote precise communication. So in order to all be on the same page, let's go through this. So gender identity refers to a person's inner sense of being a man, a woman, something else, or not having a gender. Sex assigned at birth is the sex that is recorded at birth, generally by a family physician or a pediatrician in who examines newborn and charts sex, the sex based on the appearance of external genitalia. Transgender and gender diverse individuals are people in whom gender identity differs from typically what is assigned at birth. And the term that should be used is gender incongruence, which is an ICD-11 diagnosis, as opposed to gender identity disorder or gender dysphoria that had been used in the past. So when referring to a trans woman, we are talking about uh, an individual who was assigned male at, at birth whose gender identity is female. 
and we're moving away from the abbreviation MTF, male to female, and using trans feminine instead. And similarly, a trans man is an individual who was assigned female at birth whose gender identity is male. An individual who's non-binary is when gender identity really falls outside of the traditional binary man or woman. It's important to note that hormone therapy in this patient population can promote body identity congruence, and this can take many forms. So for adolescents, this, this may mean GnRH analogs. For transmasculine individuals, this may mean testosterone supplementation. And for trans feminine individuals, this may mean estradiol in different formulations. So where do we sit in the literature in uh, transgender care and bleeding and clotting disorders? Dr. Connell highlights this paper that he says was really the first paper to put the coagulation physician at the center of this care. And this was published in 2019 in GTH by Dr. Connors and Dr. Middledorf. And really understanding the role of the coagulation physician in this patient population and in the care of this patient population by counseling patients with regards to the BT risk associated with some thrombotic therapies. Oops, sorry. And moreover, um, you know, including patients in that discussion in their understanding of the impact of our therapies, promote shared decision making and individualized risk assessments. This is a very helpful slide that can, that can be used in clinics or in, in offices that was published in RPTH in 2022 that really goes over um, hormonal therapies and the risk of VTE, uh, namely naming the hormonal um, formulations, their progesterone content, their effectiveness and their associated VTE risk. And this can be used to appropriately counsel patients. When we look at mortality in this patient population, there's a, an, a population study from a cohort, an Amsterdam cohort that was published in 2021 in Lancet that looked at cardiovascular mortality. So not just VTE, but also including myocardial infarction and stroke as outcomes. And this study really showed that trans transgender women had increased cardiovascular mortality, and this is even compared to this is compared to the general population, but also transgender men. And this should be taken into account when we care for this specific patient population. Moreover, if we're looking at the perioperative setting, this is something that we deal with often at, as throm thrombosis physician. Uh, there's this systematic review that was published in JAMA in 2019, looking at the association of surgical risk with hormone use in transgender patients. What's important to note here is that um, in surgery, the evidence regarding the VTE risk with the use of estrogen is inconsistent, um, and that thrombosis risk really is not and should not be a barrier to gender-affirming care. And really, in some instances, continuing estrogen um, perioperatively for these patients may be the most appropriate course of action while taking steps to mitigate that increased or, or maybe increased risk of VT perioperatively, much like we do for other individuals in our clinic that have maybe an increased risk of VT around surgery. This is a consensus statement and guideline that was published in collaboration with the North American Thrombosis Foundation really sort of assessing the risk of VT in gender affirming care and highlighting some key points. So we know from studies in the past that with, withholding gender affirming hormone therapy and surgery can cause substantial negative effects in that patient population, including decreased quality of life, increased mental health disorders and increased suicidality. So we need to counsel patients with regards to the risk according to the hormone form formulation, dosing, route and duration of therapy. We need to take into account also that most of our VTE risk assessment scores or tools don't include transgender individuals. And while they can be used, we need to take into account the limitations of these, of these tools in terms of applicability. And really we need to individual individualize our treatment decisions. They also came out with a very nice um, patient toolkit that is downloadable for patients and for physicians explaining the main issues in transgender health and blood clot risk. 
the Hematology Foundation also came out with priorities when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusivity in terms of research priorities. The main ones being to identify and acknowledge our conscious and unconscious biases when, when conducting research, realizing um, policies and practices that on a national and international level that can affect our patient populations. Also acknowledging that our uh, the data that's important to us as clinicians or researchers or healthcare providers may not be the same data that's important to our patients from the transgender population. And we need to sort of mitigate that and try to find common grounds. Um, and lastly, we need to uh, individualize patient behaviors and decisions by including this patient population. There's also this notion that historically, as a healthcare community, we haven't been doing a good job of being inclusive and creating safe environment for marginalized populations, including transgender individuals. And so the result of that may be that there is a mistrust of the medical community in that patient population, and we all need to work on um, minimizing this in the and how we provide care for these patients. Sorry, there's a bit of a delay when I want to change the slides. Let's just see here. Great. So what are concrete things that we can do in terms of um, improving the safety of our environment and our clinics? So these are applicable, quite easy steps. The first one being to train our staff, so our research staff, our clinic staff, to use inclusive language um, and to create a safe environment, because often that starts at the front door of our clinic or our research institutions to use non-discrimination policies and display them openly, to have gender neutral washrooms, to have transgender health brochures available for patients and for providers, to be mindful when we fill out forms, um, when we ask patients to complete surveys or when we chart into EMR, to really uh, use gender identity and assign sex after birth and use appropriate pronouns and really encourage our clinics to be allies and individuals in our clinics to be allies and promote our clinic as such. There is this sort of false or, or, or disputed notion that gender affirming surgery hasn't really shown benefit because there aren't any RCTs. And I think Dr. Connell and this editorial in the New England from last year argues that given the the robust evidence of the decrease in quality of life and increase in suicidality with by withholding gender affirming surgeries, um, we you know we should be creative as clinicians and researchers and move away from RCTs. Given the fact that it may or may not be ethical to actually randomize patients to to placebo in this instance, uh, given the known harm that it can have on our patient population. So lastly, I'm going to finish by how we can do this concretely and how Dr. Connell concludes his talk. Um, so we need to understand that we will make mistakes. The main, the main and the most common one is in misgendering patients. We need to acknowledge that, ask questions, and use missteps as a growth opportunity. Always approach the situation from a, an, a lens of harm reduction. Um, and of course, importantly, engage LGBTQIA plus experts in our research endeavors to guide the next steps. So while there are social, um, uh, there are, are, sorry, challenges in the care of transgendered health driven by social reactions, also distrust of the medical community, and also because on a single institution level, this may be a very small population, but when we look at multiple healthcare centers, this actually um, involves multiple patients. There are some concrete solutions to deliver appropriate care to this patient population, mainly by training staff and research personnel and making sure that we create a um, safe environment for our patient population, understand the societal and policy implications of our research, and collaborating across various centers, which is something that, of course, we're used to doing in the research field. So with that, um, Dr. Kimpton is going to present next. Thank you very much, Camille. Um, so I'm Miriam Kimpton. I'm a thrombosis physician and uh, researcher in Ottawa. 
I've received a uh, grant funding from Ken Vector and the Canadian Hematology Society. Uh, so at today's talk, I wanted to highlight um, updates of the PAUSE 2 and PAUSE ER trials, as well as the results of the symptoms tr trial. I want to give special thanks to Dr. Duquetis, Siegel, and Legal for providing me with their ISTH slides, which have been adapted for this presentation. I'm going to start with an update from the PAUSE 2 pilot trial, which was provided at the SSC uh, meeting on June 25th by Dr. Dekedis. And so um, there's a, the perioperative anticoagulant management is a very common problem, and most patients are now receiving DOAX. 25 to 30 percent of them will require a high bleed surgery uh, or procedure. And currently, Per guidelines, there are two approaches, the uh, ASRA, ASRA, which is the, our anesthesia colleagues guidelines, and then the uh, guidelines inspired by PAWS, so more the CHESS guideline, and also what's, um, what's on the Thrombosis Canada webpage. And how do they differ? And so the ASRA, ASRA perioperative DOAC management recommend a longer period of holding the anticoagulant, the DOAC, prior to the procedure for high-risk procedure. And so this looks more like a three-day hold. And they do say that with the risk of VTE is high, then low microwave bridging therapy can be instituted during stoppage of the anticoagulant and uh, discontinued 24 hours prior to the procedure. The uh, PAUSE um, regimen, which was actually used in the PAUSE trial uh, published in 2019, uses a shorter uh, interruption of anticoagulant of about two days. And so the objective of the PAUSE trial is to assess the feasibility of recruiting patients undergoing a high bleed procedure or surgery into an RCT to really help us compare those two methods and see if um, a one is safer or superior to the other. <clears throat> Another objective is to assess the residual preoperative DOAC level with the PAUSE and ASRA management. And so the PAUSE 2 pilot study recruited adult patients with atrial fibrillation who are receiving a DOAC, such as a pixaban, dibigatran, edoxaban, or rivaroxaban, and require an elective surgery or procedure. And these procedures need to be classified as a high leading risk, and that includes neuroaxial um, anesthesia. And then patients are randomized to either the PAUSE management or the ASRA management. Um, and so this is an update of an ongoing study. And we see that so far there were uh, 70 patients randomized to the PAUSE regimen and 70 patients randomized to the ASRA regimen. And they're generally well balanced in uh, baseline characteristics as well as procedures. Um, most patients having undergone cardiothoracic, orthopedic, or urological procedures. About 20% of patients had a, a neuroaxial anesthesia. Most patients uh, were receiving apixaban in uh, the ASRA trial, sorry, in the ASRA arm. And in the PAUSE arm, uh, most patients were receiving apixaban or rivaroxaban. And the time interval between the last DOAC dose and the preoperative blood sample is reflective of the, uh, the protocol. So it was about 86 hours in the ASRA uh, arm and 64 in the uh, PAUSE arm. When looking at the uh, residual levels of anticoagulant prior to the procedure, so the mean overall for ASRA and PAUSE were similar at 23.1 and 23.8. Most patients uh, had less than 30% of uh, measured levels. Um, three patients in the PAUSE trial had levels of 30 to 50, and you can see the, the levels here at 30, 36, and 37. And uh, three, three patients, oh, sorry, the, the, excuse me, that's 
three patients overall had levels of 30 to 50, and then um, six patients overall had, my apologies, four patients overall had levels of over 50, which are uh, written here. Um, and it's just to note that the mean level uh, disclosed here is probably not representative to the of the actual level because the assay used um, when the level was less than the threshold of 20 or 25 just expressed it as 19 or 24. And so the pilot trial conclusion for this update is that so far, um, the results support the feasibility, feasibility of a larger ICT. And there seems to be comparable residual doc levels within ASRA and PAUSE approaches, but it is underpowered to detect the small differences in level. Um, I think it was mostly used as a discussion for hypothesis generating. So, you know, having seen that in both approach, there are a handful of people with uh, levels above 30, um, is it possible to find, to find out which individuals would benefit from longer interruptions? Uh, is it based on patient characteristics? Is it based on uh, drug interactions? And so uh, there's a lot of questions that still remain, um, but importantly, this pilot trial seems to show that it's, it would be feasible to uh, propose a larger RCT to try to uh, have some more information for these questions. The second pause trial that was presented as an oral presentation by Dr. Deb Siegel is the pause ER trial. And so um, this trial looked at the management of anticoagulants for urgent surgery. And what we know for urgent surgery uh, in patients who are on anticoagulants is that there are high rates of adverse outcomes. There's limited data about the perioperative management and outcomes in these patients, and the data available to us is uh, mostly derived uh, by, sorry, through warfarin-treated patients. And so if we compare uh, DOAX and VKA taking patients um, who need to undergo an urgent procedure compared to an elective procedure, we see that the rates of thromboembolism, major bleeding, and mortality are uh, significantly increased. The study objectives for the pause ER was to determine the frequency of adverse events, including thrombosis, major bleeding, and mortality, to identify and compare determinants of adverse events, to describe and compare anticoagulant reversal strategies and resource utilization. The study design was an international multi-center prospective cohort study at 10 sites in Argentina, Canada, Greece, and USA. Adults uh, receiving VK or DOAC for any indication were included if they needed an urgent surgery or invasive procedure within 72 hours. They were excluded if it was a planned surgery or a minimal bleeding risk kind of procedure. The outcomes were a 30-day incidence of thrombosis, major bleeding, and mortality, and secondary outcome included utilization of hemostatic reversal agents and blood products. So we see here the baseline characteristics of the cohort. Um, so 70, the main age was 75 and 51% were female. Most patients were taking anticoagulant because of atrial fibrillation. The most common anticoagulant use was uh, apixaban and 38% of patients were using a vitamin K antagonist. 22% of patients uh, also had an antiplatelet therapy. Most patients underwent an orthopedic gastrointestinal or general surgery procedure. The mean time from last oral uh, anticoagulant dose till surgery was two days. And these are the treatments that uh, patients received. And so most uh, patients with vitamin K sorry, most patients with warfarin receive vitamin K, as we can see here. In the apixaban group, most patients received no treatment at all, and those who did receive uh, treatments received transfusion in the form of fibrinogen concentrate red blood cells, but also tranexamic acid and some PCC. This was similar in the rivaroxaban group. And the dibigatran group, small numbers, very few seem to have received idarizumab, and adoxaban was uh, very, very small numbers. The mean hospitalization 
in days was uh, 10. Uh, there were 12 deaths. There were 21 episodes of major bleeding and four episodes of thromboembolism, including one ischemic stroke, one acute coronary syndrome, and two pulmonary embolism. Most patients were able to restart their anticoagulant after surgery. And the time from surgery to restart in, day, in the median was three days. The author's conclusion from this, uh, this pilot trial is that this is a first prospective evaluation of unselected oral anticoagulant treated patients requiring urgent surgery. The perioperative management of anticoagulation was variable. There was some heterogeneous treatments for uh, patients receiving oral anticoagulant. The surgeries were quite um, variable as well, as well as the health settings. There were significant adverse outcome rates which did appear higher than those observed after elective surgery, especially mortality and bleeding. And further research is needed to identify modifiable risk factors for adverse outcomes and to inform evidence-based management in this population. And so um, I understand from the researchers that additional analyses are underway with their data and hopefully um, this will inspire uh, them, them and others to uh, do larger trials in this setting. The third um, study I wanted to highlight was the symptoms trial that was presented by Dr. Legal in the late break breaking abstract session. And so it's the prevention of symptomatic venous thromboembolism with low molecular weight heparin in hospitalized adults, older adult medical patients, and RCT. It's also called the symptoms trial. Admissions to hospital account for a large proportion of VTE. And in the landmark trials in the early 2000s, there was a benefit of low microate heparin with a reduction of the risk of VTE, but these were in mostly asymptomatic events. The wide use of thromboprophylaxis in hospitalized medical patients has recently been changed. It was downgraded, uh, for example, in the ACCP guideline from 1A to 1B after a decision was made to assess the benefit risk balance based on clinically important symptomatic outcomes only. There is a lack of efficient efficacy in large clinical trials using mortality as the primary outcome. The symptoms trial was a double-blind placebo-controlled RCT. It was a central centralized web-based one-to-one -one randomization of enoxaparin 40 mg sub-Q daily or placebo for 6 to 14 days. It took place in 47 centers in France and Switzerland. The clinical, there was a clinical events committee in charge of independent blind adjudication. The inclusion criteria was age over 70, admitted to hospital for acute medical illness and with an expected duration of stay of four days and a life expectancy of at least three months. There were some challenges with recruitment. And so uh, during the study, some inclusion criteria were changed. For example, the minimum age was lowered from 75 to 70 and the minimal platelet count to exclude patients was changed from 100 to 80. The primary efficacy outcome was symptomatically, symptomatic confirmed VTE uh, that included distal, proximal, and or fatal or non-fatal PE at 30 days. Secondary efficacy outcomes included VTE at 90 days, aterothrombotic events at 30 and 90 days, and all-cause mortality. Safety outcomes were uh, the major bleeding per ISTH definition at 30 days. Generally, patients were well balanced between the two arms. Um, and so um, the median age was 82 and 81. And 40% uh, were male. Okay, so going into this, so one thing to, to mention about this trial is that um, they had to um, close randomization early. So they had hoped to uh, achieve 70 events to find 80% uh, power to demonstrate superiority of uh, inoxidant compared to placebo. But unfortunately, they had to close, uh, as we can see here, with 49 events. And the reason for that being that um, they were not able to secure placebo. And so instead of changing the design 
from a, a double blind RCT to an open label trial, they decided to, uh, to, to simply close the trial after several years. And as I had explained, also uh, difficulty in recruiting. And so with that in mind, um, there were 22 symptomatic events in the inoxaparin arm and 27 in the placebo arm at uh, 30 days. And the difference was um, non-statistically significant. At, uh, at 90 days, there were, uh, which was their uh, planned secondary outcome, there were 25 uh, events in the inoxaparin arm and 37 in the placebo arm for a percentage difference of one. This was mostly driven by uh, pulmonary embolism. And uh, the authors note that all pulmonary embolism uh, that were diagnosed within those 90 days led to rehospitalization or death. So we see here the graph of the primary outcome, which is non-statistically significant at 30 days for cumulative incidence of placebo and inoxaparin. And this is the, the secondary outcome at 90 days where there seems to be a separation of the curve uh, around the 15 days that continues to be more pronounced until the 90th day. For the primary safety outcome, so there was uh, no significant, uh, no significance in major bleeding um, at 30 days with 11 in the inoxaparin group and 12 in the placebo group. So the conclusions for, of the authors um, regarding this trial is that the symptoms trial did not show a significant reduction in the risk of symptomatic VT at 30 days with inoxaparin 40 milligrams daily in older adults, patients admitted for an acute medical illness. There does not seem to be uh, an increased risk in major bleeding. However, the trial was underpowered due to early discontinuation because of drug supply issues. Secondary findings, so the 90-day um, uh, um, event rate that I presented here, do encourage the conduct of further studies in this patient population. Thank you. All right, we'll continue on. Uh, good afternoon and evening, everyone. My name is Mark Bellatrudy. I'm a pediatric hematologist at BC Children's in Vancouver. And um, I'll just get these slides advanced. So these are my disclosures, primarily related to work I do in the hemophilia space, um, which I will not be talking about tonight in the two uh, highlights that I want to cover. So um, what I want to cover is I'm going to pick up on where Dr. Samard uh, started with uh, looking at the risks of thrombosis in persons receiving gender-affirming hormone therapy. And certainly as a pediatric treater, we're, we're seeing a number of these patients at the beginning of their journey where, where uh, they are starting this therapy potentially before uh, the age of 18. And then I want to uh, switch to a different, uh, I guess, you could say DEI topic, looking around the myths and truths around tranexamic acid and how it may be better used to address issues of health inequity, primarily in uh, women with uh, bleeding disorders, women with heavy menstrual bleeding. So going back to uh, transgender care, um, this is a summary of uh, two presentations, one at uh, a uh, pediatric thrombosis session uh, by Dr. Mullins from uh, Cincinnati College of Medicine, looking at, uh, in general, the thrombosis risk associated with transgender care. And then an oral abstract uh, of a cohort uh, from uh, Boston Children's, again, looking at uh, uh, venous thromboembolism that occurred in their transgender and gender diverse uh, youth. So, as was mentioned uh, a bit in Dr. Samard's uh, slides, why do we have gender-affirming hormone therapy? Um, gender dysphoria, I now learn that this is the incorrect term, uh, but it is common among the transgender population and is associated with a significant risk of health complications, most notably suicide. Uh, transgender adolescents have a threefold higher rate of suicidal ideation. Um, and transgender individuals have almost a ninefold increased rate of suicide attempts. So gender-affirming hormone therapy is uh, one of the treatments that can uh, improve psychological well-being 
um, and potentially lead to uh, a decrease in suicidal ideation and attempts because it allows affirmation of the identified gender and hopefully alleviation of the gender dysphoria. So um, in general, that uh, means for transgender women uh, using testosterone blockade with medications such as spironolactone and estradiol, and for transgender men, uh, testosterone therapy. And uh, current guidelines um, from our endocrine colleagues suggest starting at a low dose and gradually increasing the dose to achieve target physiologic levels. So estrogen therapy, when we look at that from a thrombosis perspective, um, the bioavailability of ethanol estradiol, which uh, is generally used in the uh, gender-affirming hormone therapy space, is much higher compared to estradiol, which is commonly what is uh, the common component of oral contraceptive uh, medication, where we know a lot about thrombosis. The metabolism of uh, ethanol estradiol is slower than estradiol, uh, which can result in longer exposure. Um, and this may change the thrombosis risk from what uh, we generally think about with uh, estradiol. Some of the non-oral forms, either transdermal or intramuscular, may have a lower risk, uh, emphasizing the word may because it's, it's, uh, the literature has not completely borne that out. So the risk of estrogen for hormone replacement and contraception uh, in cisgender women we know is well documented. Um, and uh, most of the available studies in, in transgender populations using ethanol estradiol with gender affirming hormone therapy do also show elevated thrombosis risk um, with uh, has a ratio of 2.5 for venous thromboembolism, 2.9 for stroke, and 2.4 for myocardial infarction. So the other important thing in the gender affirming hormone therapy groups is that timing may matter. The at-risk period is different compared to those who are receiving combined oral contraceptives. It's well known that the thrombosis risk for combined oral contraceptives is greater, greatest in the first six months of use, whereas with gender affirming hormone therapy, it actually may continue to rise the longer they are uh, on that therapy. Just looking quickly at testosterone, um, the data is actually conflicting, um, but most data does suggest that uh, testosterone does not have the risk of thrombosis when used for gender affirming hormone therapy. It can, however, cause erythrocytosis, which on its own may increase thrombosis risk, although uh, one case series did not uh, report any findings of er erythrocytosis-related thrombosis in their cohort. But again, um, data is still evolving at this point. So just looking quickly at the oral abstract, which um, looked at the Boston Children's cohort of their transgender youth. And so out of their database, they established, found, pulled out 1,860 transgender uh, youth who had established care at their health program. And then they looked at their gender affirming hormone therapy status and then looked at thrombosis events. So in the group that received gender affirming hormone replacement therapy, which was 942 individuals, there were two thrombotic events in two individuals. And in the gender affirming those patients who had not received gender-affirming hormone therapy, the thrombotic rate was actually similar with three thrombotic events in two individuals. So their main conclusion was that uh, gender-affirming hormone therapy was not significantly associated with uh, a VTE diagnosis. When they drilled down a bit further, these are the um, five reported um, thrombosis events. Uh, as mentioned um, there in the previous slide, it, it looks like there's four individuals, but actually one individual had a thrombotic event off hormone therapy and then had a second event while on gender affirming medication. And so of these three patients, all, all of them related to their event had um, other risk factors that uh, increased the risk uh, for thrombosis. So the first patient had a left common femoral vein DVT that was likely central line related due to treatment for liver failure from an acetaminophen overdose. Um, the patient who had uh, two events actually had thoracic outlet syndrome and had DVTs on both, both the left and the right and just 
coincided at different times along their gender affirming medication journey. Um, and then the third patient was not on gender affirming medication when they had uh, two events, um, again, with risk factors for causing pulmonary embolus. Um, more importantly, though, is that all these patients received appropriate therapy for their for their um, VTE event. And if they were on gender affirming therapy, they were able to continue it. Um, with that. So the the main conclusions from both these presentations is that we have um, that um, gender affirming hormone therapy is a different approach than when we think about the uh, estrogen thrombosis risk uh, with combined oral contraceptives. And um, we have to, we have to develop more of a picture in these individuals of their thrombosis risk. And this may be a situation where we're more likely to consider laboratory thrombophilia evaluations to further assess the risk in these patients. And then, uh, as was mentioned previously, this is there's a lot of, uh, a huge amount of shared decision-making and discussion going on related to thrombosis risk, signs and symptoms of thrombosis, as well as weighing the risk of suicidality versus thrombosis risk um, when discussing when to start or if to start. And really, the focus should be on how to get to a yes for starting gender affirming hormone therapy in these patients, especially those with pre existing risk, and how and what is the safest way to do that, just because the perceived benefits and the demonstrated benefits of gender affirming hormone therapy on gender dysphoria and potentially suicide risk far outweighs not going on that um, because of a underlying thrombosis risk. So, switching gears to uh, more of the bleeding side of thing. Um, this was a presentation by my good friend and colleague, Michelle, Michelle Schultzberg uh, uh, from St. Michael's in, in Toronto, um, looking at um, barriers to access and myths surrounding its use related to tranexamic acid, especially in women with heavy menstrual bleeding. So we know that for women of reproductive age, and as mentioned, similar to the, the previous subject, I see these patients at the beginning of their reproductive journey as adolescents, um, it's the sort of infinite loop of heavy menstrual bleeding, potentially leading to postpartum hemorrhage, and then associated iron deficiency and iron deficiency anemia that becomes this infinite loop of uh, issues over the reproductive age of a woman. And this is further complicated um, by issues related to stigma, bias, myths, and period poverty related to heavy menstrual bleeding normalization and desensitization because this is the only bleeding they know, and then issues around structural discrimination and health inequity related to all of these issues um, through this infinite loop of issues. So facts about heavy menstrual bleeding, the prevalence, reported prevalence is quite wide. And really the reason for that is that defining heavy menstrual bleeding is actually challenging. The formal men's definition is a blood loss of greater than 80 mils per cycle, but how do you, that's hard to quantify. Even uh, those of us who are have expertise in this field realize it's extremely difficult to quantify what 80 mils per cycle looks like. And um, leading questions with bias, such as do you have heavy menstrual bleeding, actually can contribute and make the problem worse. Um, Better definitions have come out. So um, this is from the 2021 Von Willebrand Disease Guidelines. And their definition, which aligns with the uh, ACOG definition, is that heavy menstrual bleeding is defined as a period that lasts greater than or equal to eight days, soaking through one or more pad or tampon every two hours on multiple days, requiring the use of more than one pad or tampon at a time, requiring changing the pad or tampon during the night, passing blood clots, and if the uh, pictorial bleeding assessment chart is used, having a score of 100, which tries to capture a lot of these um, above points. Further complicating this, though, is the uh, issue of period poverty, which is defined as the lack of accessibility or affordability of menstrual hygiene tools and educational material, including sanitary products, washing facilities, and waste management. And um, World Bank data estimates that 500 million people in the world lack access to menstrual products and adequate facilities for menstrual hygiene. 
And so this leads to greater difficulty in access to menstrual products, more women and girls staying home from school and work, and then an ongoing negative impact on education and economic opportunities for these women. Now, this is not just a um, uh, developing country issue. Um, this is something that I think probably needs to be explored a lot more in a lot of our patients. Um, and so this is a UK study which looked at nearly 2 million girls aged 14 to 21 who mentioned that disclose that they've missed a part or full day of school because of their period. 13% of girls can miss an entire school day at least one month. And period poverty as far as access to products, either from a financial or or living situation uh, is is a problem. And um, one of my colleagues uh, in, in Halifax actually did an initial study exploring this in the Maritimes and found that uh, there is quite a high percentage of women and girls who either are reusing menstrual products because of lack of access or inability to afford them to be able to have a, a reasonable supply. So keeping this in mind, there's actually a, another definition of uh, of heavy menstrual bleeding, which takes into which comes at it with more of a focus on quality of life, which incorporates this period poverty and other quality of life issues, um, but is further complicated by being deeply connected to believing and validating the patient when they're describing their heavy menstrual issues. And uh, unfortunately, healthcare provider dismissal is still a core theme and an ongoing issue for patients with heavy vaginal bleeding and heavy menstrual bleeding. So this leads to uh, cycles of structural sexism where there's a stigma around menstruation in a lot of societies patients and providers being unaware of what constitutes a normal period. If you've always been heavy, that may be your normal. And which I, I'm hopeful is improving, but that bleeding disorders are under-recognized and under-diagnosed. And unfortunately, more resources dedicated to men and male diseases, which um, um, really adds to the complication of uh, properly managing and caring for these women with heavy menstrual bleeding. And so this lack of knowledge and comfort that patients and healthcare providers have in discussing vaginal bleeding contributes to only four in 10 women with heavy menstrual bleeding being reported to actually seek care for it. So the next part is just to say that tranexamic acid, a relatively inexpensive and widely available medication, may be a partial solution to a lot of these issues. And and my hope is that I can convince you that it's, it's a, a medication that is safe and can be used a lot more readily, especially in these situations. So tranexamic acid is an antifibrinolytic medication. It prevents plasminogen and TPA degradation of fibrin. So it stabilizes the fibrin clot by blocking this plasmin-related degradation. And by stabilizing this clot, you slow down bleeding potentially allow healing of damaged vessels and prevent rebleeding. It works and it's safe. It is a proven effective treatment for heavy menstrual bleeding, it has been reported to really reduce menstrual blood loss by up to 60%, significantly more effective than placebo and non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, and maybe even some hormonal therapies. And so it can and does significantly improve health-related quality of life around heavy menstrual bleeding. The recommended oral dosage is three to four grams a day for four to five days. Usually it's either a three times a day or twice a day dosing, starting from day one of the menstrual cycle. And adverse effects are few and mainly related to mild GI upset for most women. There are issues because uh, the Canadian labeling mentions complications about the risk of thromboembolic events may be increased, especially in patients using hormonal contraceptives. I'm hoping to show you on the subsequent slides that this may actually not be true. Um, and so um, this was uh, one large trial that just came out recently showing 2 million women followed for upwards of 13.8 million person years and looking at those who use tranexamic acid versus those who didn't and what the uh, VTE incidence was. 
And basically the bottom line was that the number needed to harm for taking five days of tranexamic acid to cause one episode of venous thromboembolism is staggeringly high, or I guess staggeringly low for numbers needed to harm of one in 78,549. So a very favorable safety profile of tranexamic acid that is quite reassuring that for a short course, it can be safe and really does not overtly increase your uh, uh, th thrombosis risk. Looking at uh, use along with uh, estrogen containing medications such as uh, combined oral contraceptives, um, there's 33 total studies, um, 30 studies which used it for postpartum hemorrhage with only one described thrombosis. Um, and uh, that was a case report. And then two case reports with three thrombotic episodes out of this three, three, we'll call them studies, they're really case reports of uh, antifibrin abuse with OCPs. So really this is to say that there's no evidence that intermittent use of antifibrinolytics in either high physiologic or pharmacologic states results in higher risk of thromboembolism. <clears throat> and unfortunately the current labeling of TXA and best practices are based on case reports which, as we know, is the lowest quality evidence out there. And I'm hoping that the previous slide showed that maybe this really isn't the case and um, and our thrombosis risk is quite rare and they can be used. So really the bottom line with um, having this discussion is that you still have to do individualized care and shared decision-making when considering either adding TXA in combination with patients for heavy menstrual bleeding who are on combined hormonal contraceptives and it really is weighing the benefits of therapy against the potential risk of thrombosis and weighing all those individual risk, thrombotic risk factors, comparing that to the benefit of uh, reducing bleeding in these patients. So the key points uh, is that heavy vaginal bleeding and secondary iron deficiency anemia are extremely common and its impacts are underestimated. Tranexamic acid is highly effective in the treatment of heavy vaginal bleeding saves lives and there are minimal safety concerns. Despite its known benefits, there are pervasive myths and many individual and structural level barriers that preclude its use and can propagate health inequality. And so I think first and foremost, believing the patient is the first step. Understanding that tranexamic is safe is the next step. Um, and uh, being more aware of, of its potential benefit and also my last point about period poverty is that, you know, you have to ask about it. Uh, if you don't, you may not realize that it's it's more pervasive uh, than, than we are probably measuring. So I'll pass it on to Dr. Iorio, and I thank you for listening. Good, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Alfonso Iorio. I'm an internist at McMaster University, and uh, my clinical practice is mostly in the space of bleeding disorders. And uh, let's see if I can get the slides to move on. Sorry for that. Okay, these are my disclosures, mostly for uh, uh, running uh, clinical trials in hemophilia space and um, uh, working with the World Federation of Hemophilia. So um, I will touch on two um, uh, topics uh, uh, in the space of bleeding, but I hope of some relevance for uh, uh, hematologists more in general. The first one is uh, acquired hemophilia and the second one is um, um, outcome collection for gene therapy. So I've compiled uh, information from four uh, uh, communication, um, uh, a late breaking uh, to oral and a poster in uh, acquired hemophilia. Acquired hemophilia is a rare disease, um, even if uh, um, from a average of two cases per year in our practice, we went to six cases per year consistently over the last three years, uh, still uh, trying to understand why. 
And uh, is a rare bleeding disorder usually diagnosed in internal medicine with, with participation of hematologists and can happen, of course, everywhere. The first case series is seven patients, mostly elderly, mostly male, um, without history of cancer, even if acquired hemophilia can complicate cancer, one case of pemphigus, um, all presenting with bleeding, uh, intramuscular, rheumaturia, gastrointestinal, and most of these bleeding, six in seven, at presentation being uh, major bleeding as per the ISTH definition, all with prolonged PTT, non-measurable factor eight, and uh, measurable inhibitor. Uh, the non-measurable factor eight prolonged PTT is what uh, is actually the take home message from my presentation, because this is an orphan disease and uh, looks like uh, anethizumab will offer a chance of treating, but uh, in doing so, it will mask uh, uh, the, the prolongation of PTT and the, and the factor eight um, low level, which is not a problem if you are the one intending to treat, but this afternoon, no, 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 no earlier than this afternoon, we had to take care of a patient that was on treatment with anethizumab had a trauma and was taken care of in an emergency room where of course acquired hemophilia was not at all evident anymore. This first series was treated with emicizumab cutaneous uh, um, administration. Emicizumab does bypass the absence of factor eight by binding to factor 10 and nine and doing the same job as factor eight essentially. Um, so triggering clot uh, um, by activating the tenase and is given subcutaneously three, three milligram per kg uh, weekly um, for four times for the first month, that's the loading dose, and then three milligram every other week. That's how we treat hemophilia, congenital hemophilia patient with inhibitor. And this is what in Leuven they did for seven cases of acquired hemophilia, same loading dose, same maintenance dose. Um, they did not need to continue with the standard treatment to stop uh, or prevent bleeding in acquired hemophilia, um, which is bypassing agent, um, essentially immediately after the first dose of emicizumab. And uh, they had time of um, uh, tolerizing patient with corticosteroids or, uh, um, or uh, rituximab. Rituximab was um, um, given in uh, three in seven of these patients. And uh, none of the patient had the bleedings after the uh, start of emicizumab. The the second data set I'd like to discuss uh, uh, comes from Japan, and uh, is the um, sorry for that is the um, uh, study run uh, prospective uh, uh, controlled, even if not randomized and controlled only with a before, um, after historical controls in, uh, in the, the cohort enrolled before the study. Um, two cohorts of patients, 12 patients, adult patients, um, 12 of which were undergoing at the same time immune suppression therapy and two um, had to be by design ineligible for immune suppression therapy. Of these patients, uh, uh, 12 completed treatment and two were still ongoing at the moment of presentation. This paper is partly published. Uh, Cork one was published a few weeks ago in, uh, in uh, JTH. Um, the, the Japanese group uh, used a uh, front-loaded uh, regimen where six milligram were given six milligram per kg were given on day one uh, three milligram per kg the standard loading dose on day two and then uh, this the maintenance dose was 1.5 milligram per kg um uh, from the beginning of second week weekly and the reason for this modification in regimen was to try and get to the steady state uh, uh, level um faster because this patient usually bleed uh, in a life-threatening uh, fashion early on in the disease. So as opposed to getting about a month um, of uh, time to get to the, to the therapeutic range, uh, with this uh, accelerated regimen, you will get there in uh, approximately seven days. 
Um, the uh, results are very similar in the two cohorts. Um, Pre-treatment, 50% uh, um, of patients um, had uh, bleeds, uh, while uh, only 3 in 12 uh, uh, had uh, one bleed uh, on treatment. For core 2, uh, the one that actually is more in need of a treatment, not uh, being able to undergo immune suppression therapy and then eradication of the inhibitor, there were no bleed. But of course, the numbers are um, uh, extremely, extremely small. Um, the um, treatment um, turned out to be safe. While we are very confident using emicizumab in a congenital hemophilia where there is no uh, fact, endogenous factor eight in acquired hemophilia, when you get to eradicate the, the inhibiting antibody, um, you have a rebound of factor eight up sometime to uh, um, two units per ml or, or even more than double the normal value. Um, however, there were uh, no uh, thrombotic event with the exclusion of a um, um, partially occlusive DVT that was found, um, I would say, almost incidentally in, um, uh, in one of the patients. So um, there were no cases of, uh, of DIC. There were a few cases where increased in uh, uh, protrombin fragment one plus two, uh, where uh, signaled and low platelets, but no clinical manifestation of DAC in this series. The last uh, series I'm going to present uh, is a larger core, 47 patients collected in Germany. And in this case, uh, the peculiarity of this experience is that emicizumab uses the same doses in Japan, so front-loaded administration, um, was given while delaying for 12 days uh, tw sorry, 12 weeks, uh, the immune suppression. And um, clearly, this is a, 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 an attempt uh, to fully um, uh, evaluate the um, protective effect of emicizumab from bleeding before attempting to eradicate the inhibitor, which uh, is anyways uh, uh, something useful in clinical practice where uh, discussion around immune suppression evaluation of uh, potential side effect uh, anticipated and so on may take some, um, some time. Um, the result I put on, on the first slide uh, directly, uh, there was again demonstration of uh, full efficacy and uh, safety. There were in this case two thromboembolic events uh, out of 47 patients, um, which uh, is somehow anticipated and uh, um, was uh, signal but not happening in the Japanese trial. Uh, so loading, uh, loading regimen, uh, no administration of immune suppression, the clinical endpoint was breakthrough bleeds, and again, uh, um, elderly population, um, balance between male and females, and uh, um, factor eight uh, um, down to essentially 1%, uh, these are IU per deciliter, so 1% one, 1 uh, um, inhibitor um, of 10, unit, uh, 10 units at least. Again, uh, um, um, during the 12 weeks of uh, uh, emicizumab, emicizumab treatment, there were um, a few bleeds. Uh, you, the blue column on this plot are the absolute number of bleeds. The population is about 50 patients, 47 patients, and there is a um, um, five, uh, two to five percent of uh, patient uh, reporting bleed uh, uh, at, at any uh, point in time. A steady state uh, when the drug was measured and uh, um, very good survival if you consider that untreated hemophilia, acquired hemophilia has a, a mortality that spanning the 30 percent, uh, 91 percent was uh, a good result. Last slide, really just a note. Uh, emicizumab is not a cheap drug, um, but uh, none of the treatment that are used in acquired hemophilia is uh, cheap at all. Um, uh, this uh, Australian group uh, did an attempt on a three uh, case, uh, case series to verify what happened to the cost when emicizumab is started. And essentially in both cases, there was a plateauing of uh, the cost. 
Um, I conclude by saying that emicizumab is not approved for uh, acquired hemophilia in Canada, but there were already a few cases treated, included five at our own center. And uh, so you have to do a compassionate access uh, process with Health Canada. They know uh, that this is coming. It's uh, approved by the uh, Japanese FDA and will be filed in Canada soon. Um, it's um, it's um, really easier to uh, use and more effective than uh, niastase uh, for this indication. Um, my second uh, point is on gene therapy and uh, um, gene therapy for hemophilia A. Uh, hemophilia B has a, a um, treatment um, being considered right now by Health Canada. Um, two, two, two products uh, are being considered this day at the same time. And uh, we, we would ideally have gene therapy for hemophilia B patient next year um, if, uh, if, the, if the opinion is positive. Hemophilia A is uh, um, already approved in, um, uh, in Europe uh, and, uh, and the US. Um, it, it's, there's still, uh, uh, there are still more unknown, particularly on the duration of effect and on the overall impact on, um, on the patient experience. So I wanted to provide uh, one single clinical um, piece of information, which is the long-term follow-up presented by Johnny Malangu um, of the uh, Biomarine cohort of uh, 130 for patient uh, data were used for filing and published earlier at two years. And there was a sort of a, um, a significant downhill trend of factor eight level. These are the ones shown on, um, on the screen uh, going, uh, uh, going um, further down with time. Um, it looks like there's a, a, a plateauing of these decrees uh, um, for those patients uh, who continued uh, um, for ER3 and some uh, of those who already achieved uh, ER4. And this is, of course, a very important uh, piece of information because persistence of effect is what makes a huge difference for uh, uh, undertaking the, you know, the, the burden of the initial uh, treatment of gene therapy. Uh, now, if we were to look, and, and Johnny showed a slide where the, num the number of those above 40%, those patients that were staying above 40% went down from 37 to 15 uh, to 10 um, percent during year one, two, and three, while those ending below 3%, which is considered already an unsafe zone in terms of protection, went up from 10 to 15 to 25%. So notwithstanding the average stays stable, looks like there's a, a, a sort of progressive decrease in the expression of factor eight, but not as bad as the uh, trend over the first two years was showing. Um, now, uh, these are the uh, efficacy data uh, in terms of bleeds. And in terms of bleeds, uh, uh, there's no difference essentially in the level of, uh, of bleed that this patient experienced in uh, ER1, 2, and 3 um, um, after, uh, after receiving gene therapy. Um, the number of patients with no bleeds uh, is progressively going down. Um, it, there's a lot of um, uh, discussion in the community around uh, is this related to a, a loss of effect or is more related to an achievement of higher level of physical activity, which of course is exposed patient to an higher risk of bleeding. Um, most of the bleeding uh, are uh, in, uh, in the 17 participants who went back to prophylaxis. This is considered a measure of failure of gene therapy. And there were 10 patients who went back to prophylaxis in uh, between year uh, one and three, seven who went back after year three. So again, signal that um, the, the uh, treatment effect is uh, long lasting, but not uh, completely persistent. Um, there was a lot of conversation and presentation of the causes 
And the reason to go back to prophylaxis, the bottom line is, is a very heterogeneous decision often left uh, to the um, uh, to the treating physician and the patient in a shared decision making process. Now, on a, a, a large proportion of these patients, um, we have uh, uh, probe data to measure quality of life and, and activity. And I'm particularly proud showing probe data because probe is a tool that was developed by a, a, a group of patients with methodological support from us at McMaster. And this analysis was actually presented by Mark Skinner, but done by our group. And you see that a, a large proportion of patients measure their quality of life at baseline at 52 and uh, 104 weeks. And what was shown is that uh, um, essentially the, the overall score goes up uh, and uh, the number of um, a patient um, um, with reporting um, a, a change from baseline um, uh, is uh, is um, um, a, a large a large one. Um, the main domains showing improvement are pain, um, pain as uh, use of pain medication, acute pain, uh, chronic pain. You see on the left uh, the score and on the Right, the the number of patients reporting um, uh, any of the three of the three outcome, uh, pain and um, activities activities of daily living and mobility uh, were an improvement. Um, lower number of patients reporting difficulties with activity of daily living or use of uh, uh, mobility aid or assistive devices, and a, a significant change from uh, uh, baseline. Now. Uh, last point I want to make, and I, I mentioned approval in Canada, and I mentioned uh, uh, the patient reported outcome tool that we have available here, is that uh, um, we will need uh, to ensure that this treatment is safe to continue to do a post-marketing observation for many years. And the orientation in this space is now not to do it through post-marketing trial that are essentially unfeasible, but through institutional registries. So there is a gene therapy registry launched by WFH, planned to collect data for a minimum of uh, two years, uh, that will collect data directly or through uh, connection with national registries. And our Canadian uh, hemophilia registry is already uh, has already launched the, the gene therapy module, uh, specular to the one uh, supported by the World Federation, and uh, we are ready to pool data with all the other countries you see reported on, um, on, um, on the map to uh, ascertain if gene therapy is safe, which will be relevant for hemophilia, but being the safely most related to the vector will be uh, critical information also for many other orphan diseases that will use the same vector and similar uh, uh, approach to deliver different genetic assets. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Um, we will now be opening the session for questions. So if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box and we will make sure to answer them. Okay, so we have a first question, um, I believe, to Alfonso. In AHA, patients treated with amicizumab alone without IST, is this tended to be lifelong therapy? <clears throat> no, um, they will, uh, when uh, whenever possible, uh, receive IST at some point. Um, the, the, uh, the idea behind the German study was to see if emicizumab was able to provide a feasible home deliver treatment to gain time. And sometimes you need to do um, um, biopsies more than not, find out if there's a secondary disease and you don't want to start steroid day one or start immediately the patient on rituximab without having been uh, uh, sure that there are no contraindications. So no they will receive IST at some point. It's just to gain time uh, without having to keep the patient in the hospital. Great, thank you. Question to Dr. Kimpton. 
uh, from Dr. Carrier. Thank you very much for a great session, Dr. Kimpton. Can we stop or de-escalate thromboprophylaxis in all elderly patients? Absolute rate differences seem very low, and low molecular rate heparin is an important expense for hospital. Any thoughts? Thank you for the question. So, um, uh, their assumptions had been for 2% rate of symptomatic VT at 30 days, and they were, um, you know, en route to reaching that. Um, unfortunately, like I had explained, they had to st stop the trial early because they can secure the placebo. Um, one strength of the trial is that uh, it has very high generalizability because the only inclusion criteria was elder age, which so age over 70, which is thought to be the one of the strongest risk factor for VTE. So, um, you know, it's always difficult to answer this question, partly because it's difficult to um, to know how patients will uh, do during their hospitalization, and it's a decision we have to make at admission. Um, and so do all elderly patients with a medical admission need um, trauma prophylaxis? Probably not. Um, what are the criteria to decide? There are some, um, some tools for that, but they've um, not all been prospectively validated or and there's some differences in them and some of them are very difficult to use. Um, and so uh, I think it is still a useful uh, tool to have because it's still a significant disease and disease burden for the patient. Um, but there does seem there does need to be an individualized, individualized approach when giving a thermal prophylaxis to medically ill elderly patients. Thank you. A nuanced answer. Um, a question again from Dr. Kahi for, I guess, for the EVE trial. So for myself, do you already use the data from EVE in your own clinical practice or are you waiting for Apicat? Um, So interesting question. I don't, I can't say that I've asked this question. I've asked myself this question too often, given that my thrombosis is mainly in women's health, but um I guess in my patients who are doing well on the PIX5, the cancer-associated VT, I tend to keep them on it. So I would say I probably am waiting subconsciously for Apicat and uh, eagerly awaiting for the results. So for now, I haven't really changed my practice, but to be determined. Um, there is another question for gene therapy. So for Alfonso, uh, with median factor eight levels presented at four years, I believe in the 20, 30, 20 to 30% range, do these patients receive factor eight replacement for invasive procedures? So um, they do receive uh, for major surgery, usually one dose. Um, um, it's... Uh, it's less than we would have in patient uh, uh, nowadays on standard treatment. Um, the, the, the protocols for the gene therapy trials are pretty flexible and leave these choices to uh, treater decision. Um, but I would think that yes, whoever is below 50% would not undergo major surgery without at least an additional dose. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Bellicuti, many thanks. We often get calls from pharmacists when we prescribe TXA in female with prior history of VT. Any concerns ever? Yeah, that's. I think we've all uh, dealt with that uh, in one form or another. Even uh, those of us in the pediatric world who see less VT, we still get calls, uh, whether it's with this or with someone who's already on a combined oral contraceptive. And I think the the key point. I mean. Yes, there, ha there has to be concern when someone who's had a prior VTE because having a prior VTE itself puts you at risk for subsequent VTE. But I think two things to keep in mind, the mechanism of tranexamic acid does not actually cause clotting. It stabilizes clot that's already formed. So I think we have to keep that in mind as to how it actually works. Um, and also, really to factor in uh, the, the patient's preferences and has that discussion occurred about the risks and benefits of tranexamic acid being added into their, their regimen for whatever indication? Um, is there a benefit to that versus not going on it? And how does that affect their already pre-existing VTE risk? So yeah, it's, it's a nuanced answer, but I think, um, I, th I think 
the concern about tranexamic acid causing more clotting, I think, is is something to keep in mind that the mechanism of action of it doesn't really support that. Great. Thank you. Uh, a question about the EVE trial. Do we have any data on the patient's weights? So super interesting. Not that I know of, certainly not presented in the late breaking presentation. There was no data on BMI. Um, and to my knowledge, this paper hasn't yet been published. So the, the more detailed results are to follow. Please don't forget to register uh, to VASPER 2023 coming up in October in Montreal. Registration is, of course, open and we encourage everyone to come. And lastly, if you wish to support Thrombosis Canada as a member or as an attendee, uh, please click on this link. Any amount helps. Um, thank you, everyone, for your participation and have a good evening. Thank you very much to our speakers this evening for uh, your time, sharing your time and expertise.